Um, okay, so the idea is to talk a little bit about what makes managing talent in Asia different. Uh, and three main points that I want to uh, talk about. Uh, one is that the work for talent is still on in Asia. Um, it's a combination of fast growth and efficient talent uh, available in Asia that makes it such. The second point is that bringing in Westerners, that is uh, people from Europe or uh, the US into Asia, uh, although it has been used in the past, it is often not a sustainable solution. And uh, the third point is that a clearer picture of what constitutes Asian leadership and what are the Asian leadership traits is currently lacking. Um, let me give you some data that uh, you can think about. One is uh, the growth rates in Asia. The growth rates in Asia often exceed 5% of GDP um, in several countries. China and India above 7%, but Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Vietnam, even Thailand uh, at levels of about 5% of GDP um, basically means that there is a lot of growth in this part of the world that uh, needs to be addressed by our people. Um, because of the uh, economic uh, growth, we are almost seeing an upsurge of Asian multinationals. And one of the reasons why these Asian multinationals are currently thriving is because they are cash rich and they can afford due to the exchange rates right now with uh, the euro and the US dollar. We can afford to buy Western companies that are in trouble, and we've seen that happening uh, often. Um, the third thing that's happening is a growth in the middle class. Uh, the Chinese middle class is growing uh, much faster than the rate of economic uh, the same is true in India, and the same is true in most of the uh, emerging markets. Uh, the growth in the middle class basically means that many uh, uh, companies that are here in Asia can depend on local markets. They don't always rely on foreign markets. And they can continue to grow at the speed at which they're growing because, as I said, the growth in the middle class is exceeding the pace of economic growth. What we are also seeing is then uh, uh, an equivalent increase in purchasing power in uh, markets. But it has problems. This growth uh, has two uh, parts that are not so clear. Uh, one is the aging population. Uh, this is particularly true of Japan, uh, China, and Singapore, which are the three strongest economies in the region and the population is aging considerably. Uh, in China, the one-child policy has made it uh, basically uh, inevitable that the, the population is aging. In Singapore and Japan, it has more to do with the, uh, again, lack of uh, childbirths uh, per couple. The other part that, uh, from an HR standpoint, is, is problematic is double-digit uh, staff attrition in most countries. Uh, we put a table in the chapter in the book where you can see how it, it is double digits even in the slower growing economies like New Zealand and uh, in Australia. That is also in part we do because the markets in uh, China are growing so fast and, and in India that even the countries that are slowing, that are growing slowly, the companies are growing fast outside of their home country. Uh, another item that's uh, important to note in the uh, HR realm is the fact that wage increases are often two or more times inflation. So even in Japan, where inflation is fairly stagnant and it's below 1%, even salary increases are in the range of 2.5%. In uh, China, where inflation is roughly 5% uh, uh, inflation, uh, Salary increases exceed 10 percent, and so on and so forth. Even Singapore, with inflation rates of about 1.8 percent, has salary increases of four and a half percent. So that means that uh, 
the, the cost of labor here is increasing faster. Productivity is usually enough, uh, which creates some problems. So, with that picture, what do companies in Asia do that's different? Well, let's focus on three main um, areas of HR attraction, talent, leadership development, and works. In terms of attraction, when you have such high growth, you have to basically hire uh, very quickly and you have to hire in a, in a market where everybody else is trying to hire the exact same talent. And with such high turnover, you have to replace your own talent uh, very quickly. So what we see is high volume recruiting, which necessitates a very different strategy. Um, and, and we see Asian companies as innovators in uh, using the manager-less recruiting. And what we mean by that is uh, companies that are now hiring strictly through assessment results with incredibly good results. Um, they have find a good hire as somebody who will stay in the company three years with at least on average performance. And what uh, they're finding is that in the traditional methods of interviewers through managers, their success rate was slightly less than 50%. In other words, they could flip a coin and they would get better results than having managers interview candidates. What they have now done is interviews via examinations, interview by assessments, and interviews with uh, basically bootstrapping uh, statistical approaches that allow uh, them to have a higher degree of predictability and they can control variance to about 70%. In other words, they can be 70% accurate in getting somebody in that will stay at least three years. Um, so that's one area of, of uh, innovation in Asia. But the second one is, um, in Asia it is particularly important uh, to consider that loyalty to the boss is a very important trait in Asian culture. Uh, which is a two-edged sword. On the one hand, the boss, as long as the boss stays, the employees will stay, but as soon as the boss leaves, people will leave with him or her. Uh, with so, um, many companies in Asia, in terms of attraction, what they do is they try to attract bosses with their uh, teams intact, or as much of them as possible. And they also know very well that if you lose a boss, you are very likely to lose a boss and the team at the same time. So it's a two-edged sword that must be brandished carefully. Uh, another aspect is because of the growth, uh, companies kind of in a situation where they promote uh, employees at street level positions before they are ready uh, for the job. But the risk, of course, is that if you don't promote them that fast, your competitor will hire them and promote them anyway. Uh, what uh, that has derived is that in most of the fast growth countries, the most important trait for engagement and retention is not pay, but promotion opportunities. So speed of promotion becomes a factor for companies to consider. And we see many companies then do things like create in between titles of deputy manager, deputy assistant manager, or creating between salary grades to create the illusion uh, of forward movement so that uh, employees won't leave uh, for other companies where they feel they're getting promoted. At the same time, this creates uh, considerable problems in terms of workforce forecasting. Uh, very difficult. When you're growing that fast, you are not sure Growth rates also in the range of 15%. It's uh, particularly difficult to figure out if you can uh, forecast the forecast the of error, and you end up doing a lot of what well, all chasing the vacancies uh, as opposed to trying to get ahead of fire, uh, of hiring uh, needs. The second point is uh, around talent and leadership development in Asia. Because of the decision that the bosses are not ready, 
there is a very high need of coaching uh, and mentoring from very early on in an employee's career. In fact, some companies are starting to determine whether employees are high potential before one year is up because they uh, want to get as far ahead of the curve as possible in terms of providing coaching and mentoring to anyone that can you know, remotely have uh, industry capabilities because you may need them all, not only in the fast growth environment, but also uh, as you try to retain them. Um, it is also very common in Asia to see very accelerated development, not only in, in the sense of starting employees very early in development patterns, but also to have intense and intensive uh, leadership development opportunities. Anybody who's deemed to have any sort of potential will go quickly on uh, overseas assignments, uh, cross-tutorial projects, uh, or anything that can give them visibility and ahead of others in terms of leadership development. Asia is also very uh, strong in terms of values, and these values are mostly derived from Confucian-type philosophies filial piety, but at the same time, um, because most of the Asian companies have traditionally family-owned companies, the, the founders of these companies have instilled very strong family values in their businesses. This is true not just in China, but in any society that in Asia has any Confucian type of uh, philosophy in their, uh, at least their religion, if not in their uh, their upbringing. The other aspect about development is protein careers, very common in Asia. Um, assumption, uh, particularly in uh, both Gen X and Gen Y type of employees, is that they need to take care of their own career. They don't expect the company to take care of their career. And so you find that often policies have had odds with uh, the desires of the employees. And the companies that are doing it better are the ones that can figure out, again, how to develop employees at the speed in which employees feel they should be developed. Uh, the last part that's important, and given the growth outside of Asia uh, that we are seeing, is overseas experiences. Even the Asian companies that are growing within Asia need to provide overseas experiences to their employees. If you have a Singaporean employee, it's important that they understand China. If you have a Chinese employee, it's important that they understand Southeast Asia. If you have a Japanese employee, perhaps it's important that they understand places like Japan. Uh, the last point I wanted to make is about rewards. Um, a key aspect of, of attraction and retention in this uh, environment is that it's less important than retention. You rather have enough manpower to grow, even if some of it is not very good, than uh, otherwise. Since people expect promotion to be the main driver of motivation, it's not much you have to promote your best quickly, and the others you can provide what we are calling pay for retention or importantly pay for development. Uh, it becomes very important um, to do so. And so many companies don't really practice it on the same field. Um, it is also particularly true because part of the confusion philosophy is the disregard of the individual in favor of the community, in favor of the team, in favor of the planet. Uh, therefore, individual type of merit increases, individual type of bonuses, are not usually well received. Uh, and key type of bonuses uh, can play a greater part in many, um, in many cultures and many societies. <laughs> Which then also makes a point in Asia about how you want to create a company culture that is strong enough that it can overcome country culture. Uh, it is quite true that some of the companies um, that are here, uh, multinationals, have been able to instill a culture that supersedes the country cultures, but that must mean that you 
need to have a very strong corporate culture to begin with to overcome that. Um, part of the rewards uh, approach is that you need the people, otherwise there is no business growth. Uh, one of the examples that we cite is the example of a, a logistics company in China that was growing at 23% um, CAGR every year. Uh, the interesting point, of course, being that in order to sustain 23% CAGR growth, you need to have 23% more managers pretty much every year. Um, it was very hard to train managers that fast, so you have to hire them that fast. So the, the constraint on growth became not their ability to find clients, but the ability to find managers to manage accounts. Uh, what that basically says is you're willing to hire people, like I said earlier, who are less than optimal. Uh, as long as they can manage some accounts, you can still fuel your growth. Uh, so hiring fuel growth at whatever cost becomes important because cost in Asia is relatively cheap. Uh, at particularly manager and below levels. Um, so it's productivity and the return on the investment that becomes more important. Um, one aspect also about rewards is how because of the high growth on, on, uh, on compensation, it is often the case that uh, case structures are set with uh, inflation in mind, particularly in companies where finance drives uh, the budgeting decisions around pay. Um, but the, the curves are relatively steep. So if, unless you can provide consistent increases, let's say from a starting salary uh, to five years in the company, consistent increases that exceed inflation, as we were talking about earlier, and particularly promotion increases, you know, in five years you probably expect to be promoted twice, uh, with substantial jumps in compensation, you are likely uh, not to be able to keep up with the wage inflations. And if that's the case, you're also likely to lose your employees rather quickly. So this aspect of, of uh, paying ahead of inflation and, and uh, trying to make it up on productivity is a very important aspect of how to deal with um, these issues in Asia. Uh, let me just conclude uh, by saying that um, for those companies that understand the environment here, um, there, there are many opportunities. Um, but in Asia, and perhaps more than other places around the world, uh, because of the emerging markets and because of the culture, it is very, very important to have a very sound HR strategy to help you support your business growth, growth strategy. Thank you.